Um, I am from Miami, so I could potentially try to do this in Spanish with my Cuban Spanish experience in Miami, but I think it would probably be too painful for you, so the translator would do a much better job than, than I would do speaking Spanish. So I've been tasked with three different, um, three different topics, and the first one we'll go into today is pregnancy issues in inflammatory bowel disease. So I first wanted to make it clear to everybody what the definitions are of fertility versus fecundity, because if you look in the literature, you'll see some conflicting definitions. Fertility is more of a biological definition, which refers to the ability of, of a species to, uh, to produce offspring, whereas fecundity is the actual production of offspring. And in most species, that's not really an issue. They're the same thing, because many species don't choose when necessarily when to, um, when to produce offspring. But particularly in our species, when we certainly have the option whether or not to produce offspring, it's, um, it's an important differentiation, mostly because if you look at social science articles, not biologic articles, you'll see they sometimes flip these definitions around. But for the purpose of our science, we refer to fertility as the ability to have offspring and fecundity as the ability or the, the willingness to actually produce offspring. So when you talk about fertility or the ability to have offspring, the fertility rates in women with inflammatory bowel disease are about the same as women without inflammatory bowel disease. So they're not really infertile to any significant degree. However, they have lower fecundity or actual production of offspring in large part because there is a higher voluntary child, childlessness rate. Um, this comes from several uh, s social stigma that are, that are some accurate, some inaccurate. There's a fear of passing it on to their children. Uh, we know that if one, per if one parent has Crohn's, there's only really a 7% risk of their child having Crohn's. And if two, both parents have Crohn's, still only about a third of the children will have Crohn's disease. But despite that, <clears throat> there is this, this um, concern of passing it on to their children. Particularly those with perianal disease may have some discomfort during sexual intercourse, another reason for higher voluntary childlessness rate. Um, interestingly, in a study done a few years ago, published in Inflammatory Bowel Disease, uh, we found, uh, it was found that the rate of contraception use is the same in controls as in with IBD patients, but more patients are told by their doctors, not just gastroenterologists, but also by obstetricians, gynecologists, and internists not to conceive. And we try to um, remove that stigma. We have many patients that are very successfully able to conceive and have very healthy children. So what about fertility? So we know that in women with ulcerative colitis, they have an overall normal fertility or ability to produce children. Uh, there tends to be a lower fertility in women with active Crohn's disease. That is usually people that have, um, that have ileal or perianal Crohn's disease, and like, um, in large part likely because of inflammation disrupting the normal function of the ovaries and the fallopian tubes, which are adjacent to the other pelvic organs. Uh, also, Akbar Walji and his group from the University of Michigan published this several years ago, where the risk for infertility after and I'm sorry for using if these, um, uh, if these abbreviations aren't familiar to you, but IPAA is an ileal pouch anal anastomosis. In patients that have undergone IPAA, or this ileal pouch anal anastomosis after colectomy, the risk for infertility is about threefold higher than those who have not undergone this surgery. This is believed to be in large part due to the pelvic portion of the surgery. So in those that we sometimes want to do surgery but save their, um, or preserve their fertility, we'll oftentimes ask the surgeon to do the abdominal portion, leaving them with an ileostomy, and avoiding any pelvic surgery until it's time, until they're ready to um, be done having kids. In men, there's less of an issue with fertility. Sulfasalazine is probably the major culprit. We do, we do know that it causes reversible sperm abnormalities in about two-thirds of men. Uh, this is both a quantitative and a qualitative effect in that they both decrease the number of sperm and the motility of the sperm. This, interestingly, is not dose-related, whether you're taking two or three or four grams of sulfasalazine. Uh, and importantly, within one cycle of spermatogenesis, which is usually about two months, the sperm will be healthy again. So if you have a, 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 ma a male who wants, to help, um, who wants to have a child, if you hold the sulfasalazine for about two to three months, usually their uh, fertility is back to normal. Erectile dysfunction is usually, in one study, shown to be secondary to depression, not, uh, not as much so due to active disease or surgical complication. And, uh, and finally, from about 10 years ago, a group found that thiopurines, the 6-MP and azathioprine group, does not reduce fertility. So it's mainly the sulfasalazine. So I'll, <clears throat> I'll introduce you a case so we can discuss the different parts of pregnancy and inflammatory bowel disease. This is a 26-year-old woman who was at 20 weeks gestation in her second pregnancy. Her Crohn's disease was diagnosed eight years prior. She had a diarrhea and abdominal pain, and colonoscopy revealed ileal Crohn's disease. Uh, eventually, after trying other medications, she was um, put into steroid-free symptom remission, which is always our goal, with combination therapy of infliximab and azathioprine. She's doing well for those next two and a half years, or a year and a half or so. And a year and a half prior to this presentation, she had her first pregnancy. Uh, at that time, her gastroenterologist was concerned about the potential teratogenic effects of both infliximab and azathioprine, so both were stopped when she discovered her pregnancy at week six. And unfortunately, 10 weeks later, off of medications, she had a miscarriage. She didn't necessarily have GI symptoms. She was actually still asymptomatic, 
but unfortunately did have a miscarriage. Soon after that, she restarted her medications, but as is very common in America, they'll, um, she had some ins insurance issues, and so she stopped all her medications, and prior to this presentation, was off of all inflammatory bowel disease medications for about a year. She noticed that since the beginning of her second trimester, so for about the, uh, the past six weeks or so, she was having increased, uh, increased loose bowel movements, two to four loose stools per day with crampy abdominal pain and fatigue, and also her obstetrician noted that she was inappropriately not gaining enough weight as she should. Her medical history was only positive for Crohn's disease, and on exam she was thin and somewhat anemic looking with pale conjunctiva. Her abdomen was soft and her uterus was at the appropriate height uh, relative to her umbilicus. On laboratory evaluation, she was anemic with a hemoglobin of around eight. Her, she had a thrombocytosis with elevated platelet count that usually suggests inflammation, a low iron and ferritin with a low iron saturation, saturation consistent with iron deficiency anemia, and an elevated marker of inflammation with an elevated C-reactive protein. Her obstetric ultrasound was without abnormality. The baby was growing um, without any issues. And so her physician on the outside deci decided to put her on mesalamine at 2.4 grams a day. And unfortunately, after two weeks, she had no improvement, which is when she came to our center. So there are several issues that I think warrant discussion at this point. Uh, number one, is it safe and advisable to perform a colonoscopy or some sort of imaging? The other important issue is how to counsel an, an anxious patient about pregnancy and inflammatory bowel disease. I think for any of you that have seen patients with, um, that are pregnant, it's hard enough to convince them to take something like a PPI or an H2 blocker, much less some of these more powerful immunosuppressive drugs. So it's very important to really fully explain to them the risks and benefits that we'll discuss over the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes. The next question is whether we should start more aggressive medical therapy. Uh, should we increase the mesalamine? Should we administer antibiotics? Perhaps either topical uh, or systemic steroids? Begin immunomodulators like a thiopurine or biologics like an anti-TNF alpha agent. And finally, it's important to discuss with the patient about how to balance the risks of IBD medications in pregnancy with the risk of flare. So we're often taught at first do no harm, which I think is a very important um, rule, but realize sometimes that doing nothing in the way of not giving medications can actually produce a disease flare, and that complication is oftentimes worse than the complications of the medications. So regarding how to um, safely work somebody up in pregnancy, it is safe to do endoscopy. The American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, which is our major um, American society for determining safety in endoscopy, has deemed it is safe to do a flexible sigmoidoscopy and a colonoscopy. We tend to only need to do a sigmoidoscopy in ulcerative colitis because, the, as you know, the disease is always um, in the rectum, and we can assess disease severity. If you are concerned with someone like this patient with ileal Crohn's disease, it may be important to do a colonoscopy, a uh, full colonoscopy, achieving ileal intubation. Uh, we know this does tend to be more technically challenging in the third trimester, uh, particularly as the uterus is growing, but still, nonetheless, it can be performed safely if it is medically indicated. We try to use meds only as needed, so certainly for our sigmoidoscopies, I prefer to, to do them unsedated. For the full colonoscopies, we use minimal sedation. Um, I'll discuss in my next talk what the FDA classifications are, A, B, C, and D, but uh, I'll tell you that class B is generally considered pretty safe in animal studies, whereas C and D may potentially pose a risk, but are worth administering if you feel the, the, the uh, benefits outweigh the risks. So meperidine and fentanyl are considered F, um, FDA class C, and the benzodiazepines are considered class D. In general, we try to wait until the second trimester if we're going to administer medications or do a full colonoscopy. Much like many other diseases in pregnancy, for example, biliary diseases in pregnancy, we're generally, uh, we generally believe it's best to do a cholecystectomy during the second trimester. Also for endoscopy, we believe it's best and safest to do it in the second trimester of pregnancy after organogenesis. In terms of two-dimensional imaging, MRI is preferable to CAT scan. Uh, there, are, there are some concerns in the radiology literature, but if you correctly shield the patient, these are generally done safely without issue. But again, I would encourage you to only do these uh, tests if you think it's absolutely necessary to determine your next step in the algorithm of how to work, uh, work up and treat this patient. So how do people that have inflammatory bowel disease present when they're pregnant? So if, this study is now nearly uh, over 25 years old, and you see that about uh, two-thirds of them have inactive disease, and a third had active disease. So most people will actually have inactive disease, which is very good. Uh, when they have an active disease, three-quarters of them will maintain inactive disease without relapse for the entirety of their pregnancy. So that's very reassuring for the patient that has inactive disease. Only about a quarter will have a relapse during pregnancy. However, if they have active disease during pregnancy, and I think this underscores a point that I'll make later about trying to achieve symptom remission before pursuing, uh, pursuing pregnancy, you see here that in active disease, about a third of people get worse, a third of people get better, and about a third stay the same. So it's very hard to predict in this um, population of, active, of patients with active disease how they'll do at, uh, during their pregnancy. So this is um, a busy slide. I just want you to focus on the, the red circles. This was an article from about five years ago in gastroenterology. 
And I'll just point your attention to a couple of points in the top two bar graphs. You'll see that in the top left, it's for Crohn's disease and in the top right for ulcerative colitis. Um, basically, it's the degree of disease activity at conception, which is CON, and then at each, each trimester and then postpartum. And what I wanted you to focus on on those two graphs, um, more so than the actual numbers, is the fact that the great majority of people in this study actually had inactive disease or very minimally active disease at the time of conception, and that, for the most part, persisted throughout their pregnancy. Uh, this study was done in a large Kaiser Permanente group, which is a sort of, sort of socialized medicine group in California, uh, and looking at all pregnancies over the course of seven years. Thank you. Um, so you'll see here that, for the most part, everyone had inactive disease. What, I want, what I'd like you to focus on in this, uh, in this graph here is the fact that in those patients with inflammatory bowel disease, they had a odds ratio of having an ab, um, an, a negative conception outcome of 1.65, and also statistically significantly increased risk of having an ab, um, an, a negative pregnancy outcome or pregnancy complication. Uh, this was in large part driven by Crohn's disease, and you see here that non-Caucasians had a higher risk, as did those who underwent previous IBD surgery. This is not specifically pelvic surgery or abdominal surgery, it's all surgeries versus controls were a slightly higher risk of having a pregnancy complication. Uh, but this was mostly due to, ab uh, to negative conception outcomes, mostly determined by spontaneous abortions or miscarriages. An important, uh, two important caveats from this study is that if you notice here, most of these patients had inactive disease during pregnancy, so you shouldn't necessarily extrapolate this data to a patient of yours like the patient in our case that has active disease in her second trimester. And secondly, only one out of 25 patients in this study were on what we consider stronger therapy with an immunomodulator or biologic, suggesting that these patients had, number one, very mild disease, and number two, we can't really extrapolate this data to those that are on anti-TNF or thiopurines. You see here that half of them were on mesalamine, therapy, and about a fifth of them were on steroids. So this tells us that there is a slight increased risk of conception and pregnancy outcomes that are negative, and the question is, what are those specific outcomes? And we'll get into those in the next couple of minutes. Uh, this is a compilation of four different studies, and you see here that different studies show varying results. All of them, for the most part, show um, increased preterm birth, and three out of the four showed, in, um, showed lower birth weight, which is what LBW is. And then there are scattered ones that show small for gestational age, and congenital malformations with increased risk of C-section as well. But you can see here that population-based studies have shown multiple different findings in different studies. Uh, here is a, a, is a large study from about five years ago. And again, I only want you to focus on what's in red. And, uh, and you can see here that this is outcomes of IBD patients versus controls. You see there is an increased risk of low birth weight and premature birth, as well as, con as, well as some congenital abnormalities and C-section. The low birth weight, if you notice, is driven mostly by Crohn's disease with a, with a very low p-value as opposed to the insignificant value in ulcerative colitis. So the low birth weight is driven mostly by Crohn's, not by ulcerative colitis. This study actually also did a sensitivity analysis in which they looked at the highest quality studies and the largest patient, um, patient studies, and this, these findings persisted, suggesting that there is, in fact, um, an increased risk of negative pregnancy outcomes in inflammatory bowel disease. But importantly, we find that most of that is probably related to the, the activity of disease here you see, this is uh, odds ratios for low birth weight, low birth weight at term, preterm birth, and congenital abnormalities in Crohn's disease, patients that, um, that, were, that were pregnant compared to women that had no active disease. And you see here that there were really no statistically significant odds ratios. This perhaps looks statistically significant, but it does cross one. But preterm birth, when you looked at just those with moderate to high disease activity, so this, this graph compares inactive disease versus active disease. But if you just look at those patients that had active disease that are moderate to high in intensity, they actually had an increased risk of preterm birth. But that disease activity did not increase the risk of low birth weight or congenital abnormality, suggesting that in inflammatory bowel disease, disease activity is what probably is driving preterm birth more so than other factors. So in our patient, we gave her intravenous iron, which is safe in pregnancy because she was iron deficient, and we chose to give her sertilizumab pegol, which is an anti-TNF agent that's subcutaneous, um, and that's the dosing for sertilizumab pegol, followed by maintenance therapy thereafter. By the third trimester, she was fortunately gaining weight appropriately. Her symptoms had resolved. Her hemoglobin had nearly normalized, though not completely, and her C-reactive protein had normalized, suggesting resolution of inflammation. So then the question is, why do we choose what may appear to many people to be a pretty aggressive therapy, inducing somebody with an anti-TNF agent while pregnant? So to explain that, I'll go over each of the major classes of drugs that we have in inflammatory bowel disease and what their, and what their pregnancy risks are. Uh, this is the United States Food and Drug Administration classification of, uh, of drugs. You see here A, B, C, and D and I've color-coded them into green, which is very safe, yellow, which is probably safe in the right context, and then red is completely contraindicated. 
Um, there are very few, if any, drugs that are actually FDA class A because they actually required control studies in humans. Most of our safe drugs are in the B and C range. Um, and then you have to be somewhat careful with D and then completely avoid X. And we'll go into those individually. So this is a, um, a, a slide showing you that I know that you probably have some different uh, brand names in South America, but at least in America, these are the brand names for the different mesalamine therapies. And you see the mesalamine can be released in different ways, whether it's in microgranules, which is time-dependent release with pentasa, and different coatings can help release it in the terminal ileum and colon, and yet other ones can be released with an azo bond that's exclusively colon, um, also available rectally. So what about the mesalamine? So this is, these are FDA class B and C. For the most part, they're class B. There is a meta-analysis looking at 600 pa 650 patients on mesalamines and almost twice as many controls on no medications. And you see here that none of these odds ratios are statistically significant, meaning that there's no significant increase in any of these risks, uh, any of these uh, negative outcomes for patients on mesalamines. We know that sulfasalazine does cross the placenta and is in breast milk in very small quantities. It also importantly interferes with folate metabolisms, metabolism, so anyone on um, at sulfasalazine should definitely be given at least two milligrams, if not more, of folate a day, in addition to what they already get um, with prenatal vitamins to avoid neural tube defects. And osalazine is the only one that's class C. Everything else you see is class B. Uh, we don't actually use osalazine hardly at all in the United States anymore, so it's not really an issue in the U.S. Um, and it is safe during lactation. The only other exception that's category C is acicol, um, and that's because this, uh, this uh, compound here, DBP, is an inactive ingredient in that u it coating of acicol. Uh, I think this is probably a little unnecessary and probably should be closer to category B because the study on which this is based used a dose of DBP that was 200 times higher than we see when we use acicol. So at that dose, there were some malformations, but we use a, there's a much lower dose in acicol. So um, it very likely is closer to a category B, but for, um, for the purposes of the FDA, it is category C. The take-home point is that, is that the mesalamine therapies are overwhelmingly safe in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, when you talk about antibiotics, metronidazole, is a class B, it's, it's uh, considered very safe. Most studies show no, show no birth defects, perhaps some rear cle uh, cleft palate defects when given early. The best advice is to only use it in the short term, so for example, a short course for pouchitis, um, and it is excreted in breast milk, so you should try to avoid using it uh, if you're breastfeeding or if, the, if your patient's breastfeeding. For flu fluoroquinolones, they are class C. We try to avoid uh, using them, particularly in the first trimester because they can cause cartilaginous defects, um, and, but they are okay to use in breastfeeding if you feel the need to use antibiotics for your patient with Crohn's disease. Uh, we do recommend that you avoid tetracyclines and sulfa drugs like Bactrim because they, uh, they are not nearly as well tolerated in pregnancy. What about steroids? So steroids are a class C, um, you see up here at the top. There are a large, a large number of studies that show no significant adverse events in pregnancy if you use doses less than 15 milligrams. If you use higher than that, then there certainly is that risk. Uh, there are risks of in increased spontaneous abortion and stillbirth in animal studies, uh, but those have not really been shown in humans, and the cleft palate defects were mostly studies done on, os on asthmatics taking recurrent courses of, of steroids during the course of their pregnancy. So we can't necessarily extrapolate that to inflammatory bowel disease. But nonetheless, I think that uh, the best advice is if you have to use it because you feel the disease is severe, you can, but if you can avoid it, it's best to do so. Uh, importantly, there's no evidence of any fetal adrenocortical or adrenal insufficiency or any abnormal function of the neonatal T cells um, immunologically. And prednisolone is more efficiently metabolized, so that may be your steroid of choice. Uh, in terms of topical steroids like budesonide, budesonide, there was a series of eight patients from uh, Vanderbilt University in Tennessee in the U.S., and they had eight patients taking um, the normal dose of 609 milligrams a day, and there were no cases of adrenal suppression, glucose intolerance, hypertension, or congenital abnormalities, and you can breastfeed with it. So now we'll get to the perhaps more controversial ones, and I think this is, as a take-home point, one of the more important things to, uh, uh, to take home with you, is that the thiopurines, uh, which are 6-MP and azathioprine, are class D, which are considered potentially dangerous, but uh, for the most part, if the disease requires it, it is safer to use them to, than to withhold them. So most of our data is actually not from IBD, it's mostly from rheumatology and transplant experiences, and the experiences are pretty favorable. The European Crohn's and Colitis Organization, which is ECHO, considers it safe and well tolerated by their official guidelines. Um, and it does cross the placenta, but the fetus does not have this enzyme that's required for metabolism. So in a small study of only three patients with inflammatory bowel disease or autoimmune hepatitis, they looked at the metabolites, which are 6-TGN and 6-MMP, and we'll discuss those in the next lecture. And the 6-TG levels were a lot lower, and the MMP levels were undetectable, suggesting that, it, that, we can't, that they can't effectively metabolize it, and therefore the risk is probably not that high. This is another study looking at 190 pregnant women on azathioprine compared to those that weren't, 
and they uh, did not have a difference in their risk of major malformations, which is most women's primary concern is major malformations. Three and a half versus three percent was not significant. They did have a lower weight, and they did they were born earlier uh, um, with prematurity, but most of them had completely healthy um, development afterwards. Another larger, a larger registry in Sweden looked at almost 500 patients using azathioprine, mostly for inflammatory bowel disease. Here again, you see there was no increased rate of congenital anomalies, uh, about the same with those on versus not on thiopurines. A small increased risk of cardiac defects, but this was a very small number. Um, and there was an increased risk of preterm birth and, and, uh, and low birth weight that was likely disease effect. <clears throat> and the reason we think that this is likely disease effect is from this large Danish cohort where um, I don't want you to necessarily look at the specific numbers, but know that when, we com when they compared patients taking azathioprine to those that had never received azathioprine, there was a significant increased risk in, the azathi in those patients' complications. But when you compare the azathioprine group to those who had previously received azathioprine in the past but not recently, all those numbers went away. So what does that mean? What that means is that probably the risk isn't the azathioprine, it's probably that those patients on azathioprine had more significant disease, and therefore it was the disease activity that was, uh, that was driving most of these negative outcomes, not the thiopurine itself, because when you normalize for people that had sicker or worse disease by having needed thiopurines in the past, almost all of these um, statistically significant negative endpoints went away. So again, it's probably not the thiopurine, it's probably the disease activity. And finally, the, um, the largest cohort that we have is from the French, and they did this Sazam cohort of azathioprine. And here you see no increased risk of any of the negative outcomes, including congenital anomalies. Uh, the, and so they postulated that the previous slides I showed you, for example, the Goldstein study, um, that the lower birth weight and higher, higher prematurity were probably not from the thiopurine, they're probably from the disease activity, which is actually more of a reason to give the thiopurine because you're trying to suppress disease activity and allow the woman to take her baby to term uh, in as healthy a manner as possible. This is not yet published um, uh, on, uh, it's not yet published in inflammatory bowel disease, but it's, on, it's available online. And you can see here that the risk of uh, low birth weight and congenital abnormalities on thiopurines was not statistically significant in a large meta-analysis in which they again did a sensitivity analysis and this was confirmed. There was a slight increased risk of preterm birth, um, and importantly, a lot of times people ask us, what about the father? When the fathers were taking thiopurines, there was no increased risk of negative outcomes. So I think the summation of data should suggest to you that thiopurines are for the most part safe if someone has active disease, because most of the negative um, implications are driven mostly by the, by the disease activity and not by the medication itself. In terms of breastfeeding, there's a study of eight patients who are receiving varying doses of azathioprine, all of who whom had normal TPMT activity. And you see here that the breast milk and plasma concentrations of 6MP were measured at various levels. And for the most part, I think the bottom line here is that after four hours, the levels are very low. So it probably is safe to, give th to have someone who's breastfeeding use thiopurines just wait about four hours before, um, before breastfeeding after the administration of the drug, by which point almost all of the, med the medication is, um, is gone. Cyclosporin is not used very frequently uh, as an outpatient drug, but is used to some degree as an inpatient drug for active colitis. Likely has no teratogenicity based on uh, transplant data, but we have very few clinical trials in inflammatory bowel disease. We do know it's safe in pregnant patients who are trying to delay colectomy in acute severe colitis, um, but we sh you should avoid breastfeeding. Uh, tacrolimus is also a calcineurin inhibitor, so that's also an FDA class C with similar, um, with similar uh, characteristics. And importantly, methotrexate and thalidomide are absolutely contraindicated. I'm not sure if anybody here is, is using thalidomide. We use it very sparingly in the United States. Uh, methotrexate is used quite frequently in the United States, but it's a category X. It's, uh, it's, it, ca it causes very dangerous uh, teratogenic side effects. So if, someone wa if a woman wants to get pregnant, you should have her hold the methotrexate for at least three months, probably closer to six months, uh, before trying to conceive. Finally, I'll touch on the anti-TNF agents. These are actually all FDA class B, so safer than the thiopurines by FDA class. They're all immunoglobulin, immunoglobulin G antibodies. And we know that IgG does not transfer to the placenta in the first trimester, but towards the second and particularly the third trimester, there's more placental transfer of immunoglobulin G. So the, so the earlier that you can stop the TNF, the less transfer you'll have across the placenta. The placenta has receptors for these FC, uh, the FC receptor which captures IgG1 more than IgG2. So infliximab and adalimumab are both IgG1 antibodies. Sertilizumab pegol, which is marketed as SIMZ in the United States, is the only non-IgG1 antibody, and it does not have an FC portion, only an FAB portion. So conceptually, I feel that it's probably the safest drug in pregnancy. 
but if you don't have it available, I certainly would not withhold infliximab or adalimumab, even though they're IgG1 and do have FC portions, but if you have the choice between all three, that may be the best option, at least conceptually. Um, there have been several registries, and I gave you the, um, the references below. The TREAT registry is a large reg a U.S. registry at the University of Pennsylvania. Johnson & Johnson's registry is the company's registry, and Leuven is a, a large group in Belgium which has studied this as well, and they found no increased events in adverse outcomes compared to IBD patients that were not receiving anti-TNF therapy, so it's safe. And then the Leuven data, as well as this Otis registry, and I encourage you, if you have questions, to go to this uh, U.S. website called otispregnancy.org. It's an organization of teratogenicity, and they found in rheumatoid arthritis patients there was no increased risk of adverse events. We have very little data in Simsia or in uh, natalizumab, which is an anti-integrin, marketed in the U.S. as Tysabri. Breastfeeding should be fine since breast milk is mostly IgA. You should, importantly, avoid any live vaccines in the child for the first three to six months after delivery because those do cross over to a small degree. And in terms of the final question that people have about can you have a vaginal delivery versus C-section, unless you have an ileal pouch anal anastomosis or active perianal disease, it is safe to undergo vaginal delivery um, if you want to avoid C-section. I will leave you with one final uh, piece of data, which actually just came out uh, um, two months ago at DDW. Uh, I know this is a lot of information here, but the important point of this is that this is the largest study to date. It's called the Piano Study. They looked at 30 different U.S. centers that, that treat inflammatory bowel disease. Over 1,000 patients and, random, and, and uh, looked at people that were on no medication, thiopurines, anti-TNFs, or both. And if you just scroll down to the bottom, the important part of this is that the thiopurines and anti-TNF agents were not associated with an increase in complications, even when adjusted for, or particularly when adjusted for disease type and activity. Uh, breastfeeding was also not associated with an increased infection risk. The only issue that they had in this study, and it is yet to be published, is that it, um, there was an increased amount of infections in those that were on combination therapy of thiopurines with uh, anti-TNF. That was driven more by infliximab and adalimumab than it was by sertilizumab pegol. Um, and because this was happening so late, they're taking the study out for another four years to see if this was related to immune dysfunction or just to exposure of the drug in the child. But this is very reassuring data, the largest data that we have to date, to suggest that it is actually very safe to give anti-TNF and thiopurine agents in pregnancy if it's needed. So finally, she did very well throughout pregnancy. Her sertilizumab pegol was stopped at week 30. I normally like to stop it around 30 or 31 weeks. Um, to, let as, to have as little placental transfer as possible. She had an uneventful vaginal delivery at week 38. We restarted her drug two weeks later. Um, she breastfed for about three months, which was fine, and uh, we, held all, we asked her pediatrician to hold all of her live vaccines for six months, and the baby is, I think, now three and, uh, and doing very well. So in summary, I would say avoid pregnancy until disease is in remission. So as much as people want to have children, we talked about increased voluntary childlessness rates, the best predictor of doing well with your pregnancy is being in disease, disease remission at the time of conception. So do everything you can to put them in remission at, at the time of conception, and then they can go ahead and try to have kids. Continue those medications that maintained remission. A big mistake is to stop all the medications because, because you're concerned about the drugs. I hope I showed you enough data to suggest that it's the disease that's driving more of these complications more so than the drugs. Um, obviously, if it's methotrexate or thalidomide, you have to stop it. And with the anti-TNFs, we like to stop them at about the late 20s or early 30s in a weeks of gestation. And then you can adjust the timing of the doses to achieve that. For flares of disease, early in disease, start what you need to start. If it's very late in the disease and, and delivery is feasible, you can certainly uh, pursue that. And the most important thing I think that's, uh, that I always try to emphasize as much as possible is that the mother has to come first. If there's a severe complication in the third trimester of pregnancy, as hard as it is, your primary, um, your primary interest has to be with the mother to preserve her health and safety. So make sure you put that priority first. And uh, there's a couple of nice reviews here that uh, I can refer you to. This is from the European, uh, from the Belgian group on management of IBD and pregnancy, as well as another article also um, published this year. So thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Dr. Despan.